James chapter 1, <clears throat> starting at verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not, be, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth, by the word of truth, that we, sh we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. All right, bow with me and let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the privilege it is to gather here as believers to open up your word. And we understand when we open up our Bibles, it's not just mere words we read, it is your living word that penetrates our heart, that cuts deep, that shows us who you are. And of course, this word is given to us by Jesus Christ himself. So, Lord, I pray we would not hear from me tonight, but we would hear from you, that the Spirit would move in such a way that you would give us understanding in this lesson tonight. And we thank you for this. In Christ's name, amen. How many of you guys checked your grades, frequently check your grades online? A lot of you? Well, I'll let you in in a little secret of my life. I never did that when I was your age. And the reason why is because I was a really bad student. I knew that and I knew that if I logged in to check my grades that what I would find is not something I would like. I'd probably see my grades and be really disappointed. It would be really painful. So my solution for my grade problem and having bad grades was not to worry about it. I ignored it and it would be fine. And I think you guys can see where my thinking wouldn't be wrong in this. It makes everything worse. But what if I had a teacher come to me who actually knew that I wasn't doing too well in school and wanted to help me? He or she would sit down with me and she would pull out the transcript and she would say, hey, Robbie, I don't, you're not doing too well in class. You're doing, you, you have a bad grade in my class. And it would be painful for what she said. But what if she said, you know, I want to help you have a better grade. I don't want you to fail. So initially, it'd be painful, but the teacher would help me improve my grade in the class. And I think this is, James is a lot like this. He's a lot like this teacher who helps us. But instead of showing me how bad I am, James is going to show us how bad we are doing before God. And it's painful. But like this teacher, that I just described, who wants to help me improve my grade. He wants to help us, but he doesn't want to help us just be better people. He wants to point us to the true and living God, to the true and gracious God, and show us how to live a life in grace. So he never stops at showing us how bad we are. He starts, he, he moves on to show us the grace that's in God. And in this whole first chapter, through the writing of James, God is trying to teach us to think and react to trials. And remember, last time we said trials are any hardship we face. We, we want to think and react to trials in a, in a godly way. And sometimes it's painful because these teachings reveal who we really are deep down and in secret. And he continues to do this in these verses. Last time we saw that the purpose of trials was that they're supposed to lead us to rejoicing. And the first pitfall of our thinking is that when we experience hardships, that that God has no reason for them. But we actually saw that God uses trials to grow us and help us to be steadfast. That's what we talked about last week. That's just one piece of the pie of what James is teaching us. And he's going to teach us another piece of the pie tonight to make us more whole. So in verses 12 to 18, what I just read, James wants to help us to avoid another pitfall. And that is the temptations that we face in our trials the temptations that we face in our trials. That's what he's going to help us with. And the big temptation for us is to blame God and others for our failure and our giving into our evil desires. 
How does he go about this? How does he, how does he deal with us? How does he help us here? Well, the first thing he does is he forces us to be honest with who we are. This is the painful part. This is like us seeing, this is like me seeing how bad my grades are. But then he shows us a good and powerful God who is able to give us new life. And that's the part we want to look at. So this is the big thing James is teaching us tonight. In temptation, we need an honest view of ourself and we need a right view of God. We need to look at ourselves and be honest with who we are, but we can't stop there. We have to look to God for the solution. But before I go into this, let me remind you, you're going to be tempted as I go through this teaching to, be, to say to yourself, James is trying to make me a better person. James wants me to just, you know, pull up my bootstraps and just get after it and be a better person. That's not what's going on here, and I hope you guys will see that. He's telling you that you actually need new life in order to live the way he's saying. You need to be a follower of Jesus, in other words. You need to know the gospel. So with this in mind, let's first talk about how we need to be honest with ourselves. And this is in verse, sorry, the slide's wrong. It's in verse 12 to 15, 12 to 15. And before, before he talks about how, you know, we need to write you know, an honest view of ourselves, he, gives, he puts before us a promise in verse 12 that's going to introduce this idea. And what James is saying is that if we endure trials in this verse, there's a reward for this. There, the, the reward is the crown of life. That's what it says. And the crown of life basically says, the crown of life is basically God um, being with God in eternity with his people. It's eternal life with Christ. And, when this crown, and this crown is received not on the basis of performance, but on the basis of a relationship with those who, it pro, who with those, like it says in the verse, which God has promised those who love him. In other words, he's keeping our eyes on the price. He's encouraging us to keep going because of this reward we're coming to. But as you move on in, in the paragraph, you look down at verse 13, and there seems to be a really quick change in topic. This happens a lot in James, but I, I want to show you real quick that this is not necessarily the case. I want everyone, and uh, well, ver, I want to say verse 12 is like a hinge. It connects this first chunk of verses, 1 to 11, to the next chunk, 12 through, uh, 13 through 18. It's like, a, it's like a hinge. So here's what I want you to do. Raise your finger, okay? Point your finger in your Bible to verse 2 and point to the word trials, okay? Everyone there? Now, move your finger down to verse 12 and point to that other word, trial, okay? So you see he's continuing it with a theme of trials. And now, point in verse 13, point to the word tempted with your finger, okay? You see that? Trials, trials, tempted. Those are actually all the same word. The word tempted is the same word in verse 2, uh, two and 12 and in verse 13. In verse 13, it has a different meaning. We'll talk about that. But the reason I wanted to show you this is because I wanted to show you James is still on the same topic. He's still talking about trials. But now he's going to introduce another part of this. He's going to talk about the temptations we face in trials. This is kind of like... a if you've ever seen Inception, Dream Within a Dream, this is like a, a trial within a trial. Except this trial we face isn't, doesn't come from God, like the ones in verse 2. This trial comes from within us, from within our own evil hearts. So in this next section, James shows us what would prevent us from receiving the reward that's in verse 12, the crown of life. These are the temptations that we need to overcome that would prevent us from receiving that. So we need to know these obstacles in order to avoid it. And the first temptation is that we think too highly of ourselves. We don't have an honest view. You don't have an honest view of yourself. That's what James is saying. And what James is going to do is he's forcing us to roll back the curtain. He's for forcing us to peek behind the curtain of who we really are deep down inside of our hearts. And it's painful. And he does this in two ways. He shows us that we tend to shift blame on God. And secondly, 
he shows that he brings out a specific and honestly terrifying truth about who we are. That we are to blame. That our sin is our own fault. So those are the things he brings out. First of all, God isn't to blame. Here, James commands, let no one say, I'm being tempted by God. God is never to blame for our temptations or, or failures into sin. I wonder if you were ever a kid, you said something like to your sibling or to your friend when you got in trouble, oh, she started it, or he started it, he made me do it. We all do this. And if we're honest, we still keep doing this. But if we're truly honest, we actually do this to God. We do this to God. We learn in the last section that God tests us so we grow. But what about the times when we fail the test? Whose fault is that? And then the thought creeps into your head. I wonder if God wanted me to fail. After all, he's in control, right? So he put this in my life so I would fail, right? Is this God's fault? Is it God's fault that you fall into temptation? James' answer is a hard no. Look at verse 13. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So why is it not God's fault? Because of who God is. God is sinless and perfect. How could a sinless and perfect God want his people and his creatures to sin? So what gives us this temptation to sin? What, what actually causes us to sin? We do. We are to blame. This is where we need to be painfully honest. Where you guys need to be honest with yourselves and me and everyone else. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. His own desire. The reality is we give it to the temptation because it's in our nature to love sin. And look at the downward spiral he's describing. It's temptation, which in and of itself isn't sinful. It's just a test and a temptation. Temptation to desire. And we give in to that desire and we sin. And the ultimate end to our sin is death. Temptation, desire, sin, death. And these words he uses, lured and enticed there, can help us understand what's happening here when we're tempted and when we give in to temptation. Think about fishing. When you throw in the line, you put the bait on the hook, and when the fish sees the hook and he sees the bait, he, he's lured and enticed by the bait, and he swims over to the bait, and he grabs it, or he you know, bites on the hook. But he's hooked in his mouth, and then he is dragged away. That's how the NIV translate lured and enticed. He's dragged away by the hook. And then he's taken up out of the water. This is a good picture of what temptation is like, of what our hearts are like when we're tempted. The end result is death. This, the Bible shows us this over and over again. Think about Adam and Eve. What, what did God say would happen to Adam in the garden if he took the fruit? What, what, what did he say? Yeah. That they would die, right? That they would die. And surely enough, that happened. Or think about Cain and Abel. Cain, jealous of Abel. He sins there. And what's the end result? Cain murders Abel. Death. Death is the result of sin every time. And it's not only with the visible sins, it's with each and every sinful thought we have in our heart. That's what Jesus said. If you're angry at your friend, you actually murder him in your heart. And that's just as bad as doing the act itself, right? So the ugly and honest truth is that this is the ugly and honest truth, that we are to blame for our sin. And we clearly need to do something about this, right? We can't just ignore it like I was doing with my grades. Because if we ignore it, we just, it just leads to death. What do we do? Some of the solutions that are proposed by the, uh, the world that you guys live in go something like this. If you can't beat them, then join them. Or just give in. Or look within yourself. This is what people say. Or in the words of Elsa in Frozen, let it go. 
Let it go. The problem with looking within is that when you look there, all you're going to find is rottenness and evil and deception. The problem with letting it go is that sin will never let you go. It will latch onto you like a leech and suck the life out of you. So what does the Bible tell us? Well, as James goes on, he says, don't be deceived by this. Don't let it go. Don't look within. We see that that only leads to death. There's no hope in those solutions. If our desires lead to death, then ultimately, what, what do we need? We need new desires. We need new desires. So where do we look? We don't look in. We look up. We look to a good and gracious and loving Heavenly Father who sent His Son We need to know this God if we are to have any hope for ourselves. And this is what James gives us, thankfully. He gives us a right view of God. A God who is good, dependable, and gracious. And James goes on in a loving way. He says, uh, don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. He often says that when he says hard things. And I'm saying that to you now. You know, hang in here. Don't be deceived into that type of thinking of temptation, but yes, but also don't be deceived into any wrong or small views of God. Listen to me on this one. Really, just think about this, please. How you view God, how you personally view God, who you think he is matters for everything in your life. Who you you think God is will affect everything you do, say, and think. If you think he's out to get you, you'll never turn to him. Our temptation, as James says, is to think God is out to get us. He's out to trap us. Or he's just a better version of ourselves. But James corrects this and shows us that we are the ones who trap themselves, or ourselves. We need to reverse this thinking. God is not the one who traps us. He's actually the only one who can break this sinful loop that we fall into. He's the only one who can break us from the sinful trap. And he is not like us. His goodness and his love is so much higher than ours. And, he, and James shows this. He doesn't just say it. He shows this and proves this to us by giving us characteristics of who God is. I wonder, do you guys ever think about uh, who God is, what he's like? Well, we have a lot of th- these verses here give us a lot to think about. And I want to think about it with you guys. And there are four specific things he mentions to help us to see just how good God is and how unlike us he is. And the first thing he says there is in verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above. He says God is the giver of all good gifts. If we are tempted to blame God for our sin, which is what we do, it is because we forget who he is. We forget a simple thing about God, that God is good. We forget that. James told us that he cannot sin or tempt in verse 13. If he doesn't give temptation, what does he give? He gives good gifts. What does that mean? It means that everything that comes to you is actually, in an ultimate sense, not, will never, it means that not one bad thing can happen to you if you're a Christian. Now, you will experience trials and tribulations and hardship, yes, but they're all for your good. Not one bad thing in an ultimate sense will ha- bad will happen to you. It's ultimately for your good. Secondly, he says God is our Father. Think about that. This is part of his goodness. Because of what Jesus has, has done, we can come to him as Father. James adds he's the Father of lights, which his audience would recognize that what he's saying about God is he's the creator of all the stars and the planets and the and the moon and the sun. He's the creator of all that. He created these lights. We depend on these lights to live, but God is actually the one who created them. That's how he's unlike us. But isn't that amazing? That the God who, when you look up at the night sky, and I don't know if you've seen a lot of stars ever, maybe in a, on a road trip or something, but when you look up at the night sky and see the majestic you know, tapestry of the stars, you can say, the God who created those is my God. 
He's my father. He's the father of lights. Thirdly, he says God is unchangeable. He says there's no variation or shadow due to change. He's using a, a kind of a word picture here. I imagine like a sundial. You guys ever seen a sundial? It has a little, you know, point thing in the middle and the sun shines on it and it has the numbers and you can tell the time by the shadow of the, uh, of the point in the middle. And the shadow moves constantly and you're, you can see the shadow go and tell you the time. God's not like that. He doesn't shift like that shadow. What does this mean for you? It means that God is, depend- God is dependable. That everything he has said will happen. He doesn't change. And the reality is the same about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But above all, what James ends with is that God is gracious. Look at verse 18 with me. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. God is gracious. Look at the contrast. Look at the difference between verse 15 and verse 18. Verse 15 is our desire gives birth to death, ultimately. In verse 18, God's will or desire leads to life, leads to new life. God's not like us. Our desires bring forth death and sin, but God's will brings forth new life. This is, this is where we get our new desires from a gracious and heavenly Father. These new desires, we need so much to break this cycle. God, of his own will and choice, he creates life in us. And how does he do it? Look at the verse. Through the word of truth. What's the word of truth? What's that? That's James' shorthand for the gospel. He's saying it's the gospel that brought new life to you. It's the gospel. And he's saying that to his audience, but he says that to you tonight. Yet you, you see that Jesus was tempted as we were tempted also. But instead of giving in, he never, oh, he never gave in, he never gave in to temptation. Unlike us, he overcame it. This is what Hebrews 4.15 says. I'll just read it to you guys. For we do not have a great high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. Jesus was tempted in every way you are, but he never sinned. He's the one who broke this loop, this cycle. But he still had to die. Why? Why did Jesus have to die? Not because he sinned, but because you sinned. And he wants to save you from your sin. Jesus died so that he might take on your sin and die your death, so you'll never have to experience an eternal death. And he died and he was buried and he rose again so that we would do the same with him. As Jesus died and was buried and rose again, so we are with him if you believe. When you believe in the gospel, you spiritually, you die. And you die to your old way of life. And then by the spirit, you are raised to new life. You are raised to new spiritual life. This is a life of new desires, a life of following God, a life of wanting to please God and Jesus, not looking to him as some sort of uh, a God who, who, wants, who wants you to, to be, who wants you to earn your way to him, but a God who comes to you and says, come to me. James tells his audience that this is what has happened to them, that they've been given this new desires. This is what he says, that they are the first first fruits of a new life. When a harvest was taken, you would go out and have the first fruits, and those those were the best fruits, and those were given to God. But this indicates that they were only the first ones to believe. That means that There's a whole harvest coming, and that means you guys are a part of that if you believe. They were the first, but there's a whole harvest, and God is gathering his people. They're not the only ones who receive new life. It comes to you also. And when it comes to us, we're still not perfect. That will come one day, as we said in verse 12, but when we receive the crown of life. But for now, 
you have the power and desire to overcome temptation when it comes to you. So he, here's what I want to say. If you're a believer, do everything you can to avoid the trap, the trap of this temptation, desire, sin, death. Do everything you can to avoid sinning, because not because you're trying to earn your way to God, but because you want to please God, because you want to know him. You don't want to disappoint him. And how do you do this? By constantly reminding yourself that God is good, that he's dependable, that he's loving, that he's merciful. And when you fall into the trap, remember that God is gracious. That's the biggest thing we said, right? And in another, there's this apostle, his name is John, he wrote a letter and he says this in his letter. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Christian, believer, students that believe, be honest with who you are. At the core, you're ultimately rotten. But don't stop there. Remember that you've been given new life. And make sure you have the right view of God. If you don't believe in the gospel, then I want to tell you that the honest truth is that you're a sinner and you're in rebellion against God in your natural state. That's how we all begin in this world. And God has every right to judge you as a sinner, as condemned. But... But God is gracious and merciful. In fact, he desires, like we said in verse, time, verse 18, he desires that you would come to him and receive life in Christ. We said that God gives good gifts. Well, what's the ultimate gift? Is not the ultimate gift salvation in Jesus Christ? Is the receiving of this new life? I wonder if, if you've received it. If not, why not? It only takes simple belief in him. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that uh, speaks to us. We thank you for the word of truth that saved us. Lord, it's the gospel that saved us. That This is uh, not anything we could do on our own, that we are actually separated from you. But you, Lord, by your own will and desire, you give us new life. And so that we can avoid temptation. So that we can overcome sin. And Lord, we won't do it perfectly because... As another writer says, the old man still lingers, and we're fighting, and we're fighting, Lord, but we're fighting to receive the crown of life. Help us to do that. Help us to finish well. Help us to look to the prize as we go about our week, Lord. And help us to remember that you are a good and merciful and gracious and dependable God. You've proved it in Christ, so how could we doubt you? Help us to not doubt and be double-minded, like James says, but help us to hear and do the word. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.